the creator of the universe, the one who sent his son to die for our sins. And through him, we have been reconciled back to him. Through him, we are called sons and daughters of God. Through Christ, our names are written in heaven. And until then, he has called us to serve the Father. And we bless this great God. And we honor him tonight. And we ask him to continue to bless us. So as we look into your word, Father, speak through me uh, to your people. And all who shall listen to this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good. So we look at a very fundamental topic that's building an intimate relationship with God. <clears throat> building an intimate relationship with God is something that can easily be overlooked. And in our days, in fact, it has been overlooked. So our text is Isaiah 29 13. Where the prophet, uh, yes, addressing the Old Testament believer, that this that the Lord says, that's Isaiah 29 13, these people come to me, come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus also quoted the same text in uh, Matthew 15, in the same Isaiah, uh, again, encouraging the people to be true uh, children of God. And as I said, it's something that is really, really lacking these days. And we can easily be with the Lord and not be in intimate relationship with God. It's, it's, it's very common, very easy, for the reasons that we shall discuss. But the type of relationship that God wants from us is what Jesus tells us in John 10, 30. He says that I and the Father are one. They are one. They are intimate. They are one. That, that's the kind of relationship God expects from us. Now, I mean, be one doesn't mean physically they are one body. No. In that sense. You're talking about unity of heart, purpose, everything. They are intimate. They are close. They are, they are one. And because we are also God's children, this is the type of relationship that the Father expects. And especially, you know, uh, considering all that God is doing for us and through us, uh, we need to remind ourselves of how we can be intimate with God. Amen. Amen. He said, says, I and my father, they are one. They, they, are, they, are, they, they are one. So, uh, so let's try to look at what this intimate relationship means. And then we'll mention two main importance of this. So, what is an intimate relationship with God? This is a relationship that involves your spirit, your body, your soul. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. That's uh, David Lendy, Psalm 51, verse 6, verse 17. It is a relationship that grows from you are mine. So you are mine. To you are mine. I am yours. So mutual. And then it ultimately becomes I am yours. That's what it means to be intimate. So first we come to God. God, you are my father. Then we claim everything. Then, you know, we want him to bless us. Then as we mature, we also say that you are my father, I'm your son. Means we are now also giving ourselves to him but partially. But then as we mature, then it becomes that I am yours. That's intimate. That's intimate. We grow. So beginning, anyone who is born again uh, in, uh, in the initial stages were like, I love Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. He's my everything. And the joy is just great. And Jesus is my everything. And when we are in trouble, so Jesus my Savior, and rightly so. 
But then as we mature, we will also begin to offer ourselves to the Savior. And then when we are truly matured, we say that we are for him. Because we'll begin to see his greatness and the fact that he's worth all that we have and are his given us. Amen. Amen. So it becomes a self-surrendering to God. And this leads to lost in wonder, praise, and love. That if you, are, you are finally lost in him. That is intimate. So then you are one with God. Uh, Luke, uh, let's read John 17, 10. So here, now Jesus, before going to the cross, uh, was really on that night. 17, 10 said that, that Jesus speaking here, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine. Yes? Now Jesus saying that. But that's good. And the glory has come to me through them. So here, there is that a mutual sort of uh, a benefit acknowledgement. But then when we go to Luke chapter 22, we will see that Christ now abandons himself. And say that, not my will, but let your will be done. So that's the third fix. Verse 42. So verse 41 says, Luke 22, 41. Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Say, he was lost in the love of the Father. At this point, he said, Adios. And then the verse 43 says, An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Let your will be done. That is, he was so intimate with the Father that he surrendered and said, I am yours. Intimate relationship. It, it, it grows. It, it, it grows. And this is what is lacking today in even in Christendom and even uh, everywhere in the church we see in the distance. Good. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, the importance. Uh, of course, uh, yeah, you would like us to read a bit. Um, yeah, yeah, Matthew 20 to 35, how Christ ex explains to us that our love for God, Matthew 22, 35. So an, an expert, one of the one of uh, of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's it. So, so our love for God should be that. Yeah, I mean, I mean there must be some, some kind of heartbeat for God in your heart. In your mind, God must be there. In your soul, in every aspect of your life. There. So, so, so the prophet was telling the people that you come to God to worship, but it, it's only here, lip service. That, that God is not really, so there's not intimacy here. Now, he, he continues. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like, hey, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophet hang on these two commandments. Amen. Amen. Uh, they, um, this is the kind of relationship that Jesus is talking about. Where there is self-abandonment, where every aspect of your being truly loves God. It's surrender. Not my will, not what I want. It is what you want. That's intimate. Because then he is greater than that. So we cannot even say that he is for us because we cannot contain him. So we say that we are for you. And then because he's great, then we, we are lost in him. 
but then we become one with the Father. We are lost. It's something that is lacking. Now let's mention two importance uh, of, of why this is, is key. Now, I, I, yeah, the video that I said, I think 54 second video, people want the things of God, is it? But they don't want Him. They do everything about God is good. Everything about you is great. Everything about God is good. But the people love it. They love it. I mean, there are some people they will never go to church, but when it's wedding time, they want the priest to come and bless them. In fact, they will look for the best of the cathedrals to go and do the wedding. And God himself. No. So what the man said, I think it's a reflection of you know what we are as a society here. That we love the cathedrals, we love the peace that the gospel brings and the laws of God that help us not to be you know bad people, but we don't want God. So he said that he was happy that the number of Christians in UK is going down. He's happy with that. He's happy that, that, that Christianity is going down, but that he's not happy that all the ethos are being replaced, you know, with something else. So, so people love the things of God. And even in the church, people love the blessings of God, but they don't love Him. Now, the result of this is that we also miss intimacy with one another. <coughs> oh yeah, these days, you know, I talk to a lot of people, I'm counseling them, and then the more you start, the first thing you uh, spot is that there is no intimacy. So, the man is here, the woman is here. I'm talking about marriage. But there is no intimacy. And I think sometimes, uh, in counseling sessions, some of them, I think they see that as a platform to, 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 to wise up. So, they don't even mind Teaching out to the husband, the, the woman teaching out to the wife. They, they don't, it, yeah, because they know you're the counselor, you are there to make peace. So they, they, they do that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's, it's everywhere. So if in marriages and in relationships, there's no intimacy. There's no intimacy. Because we can only know what true intimacy is if we can you know, relate to God in that sense. And so that's one of the things we see. So, so these days, people can say, oh, I love you. I mean, those what was when I say you love someone, oh my God. I mean, that was a serious expression. But these days, they will say, I love you, I think it's just a greeting. <laughs> I, I think they are greeting you, but like, oh, I love you, babe. <laughs> 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 yeah, I love you, I love you. But, but there's no love. There's no intimacy. No, it's, it's everywhere, everywhere. See, there's no intimacy. There is no love. Uh, in, in, in marriages, in families, in the church, you know, in the church, I mean, I mean here we, we, are doing, we are doing better, but you know. I know quite a lot of stories out there. And I think the reason is that somehow we have forgotten how to be intimate. Or we don't know how to be intimate. That we don't know. I think we are at a level where we think he or she is mine. Therefore, he or she should do what I like. And if I'm not getting that, then then I'm out of it. I don't like it. So, everywhere, at the workplace, in the church, you know, some people can say, oh, I love the preaching, but I don't like the praise and worship, therefore I'm looking for another church. The town say, oh, I love the praise and worship, but I don't like the preaching, it's too harsh. So, so, so we want everything in, in the world to serve us. So when we talk about even love, we are at the first uh, stage of he, she is mine. Meaning, you have to do what I want. If not, I'm not happy. 
That's it. That's what is going on. And so what is happening is that most people's love has grown cold. So of course uh, this can lead to abuse because you give someone your best, and and then if you are short of one sentence, then that's it. Yeah, it's it's happened everywhere. I mean these days, of course, there are young people, so I cannot go a bit more deeper. But uh, but, but when we do, you know, other seminars, I, I can be talking about a lot of things here. So so there's no intimacy at all. The best form of love is. He is mine, she is mine, therefore I should be satisfied. If not, trouble. I'm not happy. And that's how we treat God. And that's how we treat But that is not how it is. It is always, he is your, she is your, you are also for him or her. At least, if you can get to the second point, you don't mean to be, at least. Because it's difficult to be lost in a human being, is it? Because you cannot trust human behind a person. So at least you are in him or her. So at least your identity is also there. In terms of any trouble, you are still there. But in God, you can be lost. Because he is faithful. So Jesus said, not my will. Let your will be done. And that led him to the cross. To die for the will of the Father. But he was still in a safer hand. Because it was the Father. So on human level, we can be at least uh, at this at this at this point that he is mine, she is mine, but I am also for him or her. That one will be intimate. So then the two shall become one. But when it comes to the things of God, we mature. And say that not my will, let your will be done. That's intimacy. Then we are lost in Him, in His presence. We are lost in His love, in His grace, in His care. And then there will be love. Because when love is one way, what it does is that there will be abuse at the other end, and the one who is always loving will get tired. If love is one way, the one doing the love will get tired. And the one receiving the love will not appreciate it because they, 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 they've given nothing. They've, 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 they've not given anything away. Good. The second reason why this uh, intimate relationship with God is important, at least, so let's bring our message home. Now we are preparing ourselves, we are doing a lot. So the, but unless uh, unless we are intimate with God, as we shall see, God will not accept our service. He will not accept it. And it will surprise most people to hear that. Look at David, you know, that great project. A service or ministry that is not from an intimate relationship with God will not be accepted. God will not accept it. No. No matter, we can sing, we can pray, we can go to, have, uh, to, to, to do evangelism, but if there is no intimacy, if it's not coming from our heart, God will say, no, I don't want it. So the prophet was saying that the people worship God by with their lips. It's not from their heart. So David had a good plan. Yes, second Samuel says, let's go there. And then he said, I'm going to bring the ark of God because the Philistine in the days of Saul captured it. And the ark of God was there. So he said, I'll bring it to Jerusalem. So, verse 2 Samuel 6 1. But God said, At this project, I don't like it. The idea is good, but I don't like it. Because it's not from your heart. You, you, you have not been thorough, you have not taken your time to follow. You know, things the way I want them. So David again, I'm reading from Second Samuel 6. David again brought together all the able young men from Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Baal in Judah to bring up there the ark of God, which is called by the name. The name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart 
and brought it from the house of Abina, which was on the hill. So that was the first mistake. You, you don't even put the ark, ark on a cart, driven by an animal. It must be carried by the Levites, who have consecrated themselves and are holy. And then, and then uh, they take step, few steps, because it's the Lord God for my coming. But David, in a hurry, just you know, got some animals, a cart, put the ark on it. Boom! Let's go. And then the animals were boom. They were going. The half of God. The half of God. Once it is carried, the whole nation worship. And it shouldn't be carried by an animal, but by a consecrated, special people chosen even before the creation of the world. The lever. You want to carry the ark. The presence of God. So they were going. And then it says, uh, Uzza uh, and, uh, and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the, the new car with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. He wasn't even qualified to do that job. <laughs> he wasn't qualified. But fine. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord. With a castanet, half lies, a timbre, sistrum, and timber. They were happy. So it sounds like the church service can be great. Like today, in most places, I tell you, the praises, oh my God. If, if you don't know how to dance, you will dance. Ah. In, in, in some church, you will dance. Everything spot on. The light, the music, the instrument, everything. But most of the time, it lacks the substance, the love of God. So, so yeah, the people were happy. But since they, when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, uh, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the Uzzah stumbled. The, the, the ark, no one is supposed to touch it or look inside. And here was this ordinary guy, and because the Uzzah were just, you know, going like that, and it was just about to fall. And so the, I mean, Uzzah just touched, hold it, keep it in place. Again, he did it carelessly. No respect for the things of God. At all. But so the, the lost anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Hmm. Eight. David was angry because the lost wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perex Uzzah. Nine. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? This is a, there's no more fear of God in our eyes. They was afraid. I mean, try to keep the fear of God in your heart. You'll be fine. Always fear God. I know people say, oh, you don't have to fear God, respect God. My friend, fear God. And the people say, oh, that word fear means have reverence for God. There is reverence for God and there is a fear of God. Why? If you don't fear him, he will deal with you. Yeah, let me go deal with you. On the last day, he will put you in the hellfire. You say, oh, don't fear God. David was afraid of God. I mean, just imagine, you know, how do you call it? And you say we are doing a project, either painting or doing something here, and then someone will touch this microphone, then boom, the person is gone. Hey! All of you run away and say, oh, what kind of church be this? You run away. It, it will be in the newspaper. You run away. That's what happened. David was afraid. He said, hey, how this act of the Lord be? Now, 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 now let's read First Chronicles. How David found out what I needed to be done, and then, and, and then he went on to do that. So, First Chronicles. And the rest of the story will tell us that that uh, the the ark was finally brought, but the, the, we, 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 we are, yeah, I mean, Second Samuel doesn't tell us a lot the details, but First Chronicles fifteen. Uh, 11, 16, and 25, we get a bit more. 
So, uh, the priests were very kind to to just investigate what really happened. So now, David will do it again. Will go and get the ark from you know that I mean that place back to Jerusalem. So sometimes when you don't succeed, you know, try again. So as we are preparing ourselves to do all kinds of things in the kingdom, sometimes we'll fail some. Sometimes we'll not get things done right, and God will not accept it. All we have to do is to sit up, and then we do the right thing. Amen. You don't have to give up. You don't have to be upset. If you don't be upset, you know, be afraid of God. And ask yourself, what else should I do so that God will accept my service? So David heard that the, the man who took the ark into his house was blessed so much that he said, I'll go and take the, the, the ark back to Jerusalem. 11. Then David summoned Zadok and Abatiah the priest and Uriah, uh, Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and uh, Aminadab, the Levites. Now listen to what David said. He said to them, you are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. 13. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. Have we said that? So David said, you, the Levite, you did not do it. So ordinary people were the ones who did the job. And God, God, God was upset with us. He said, we did not inquire of him how, inquire of him about how to do it in a prescribed way. So the priest and Levite consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God with, so, 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 so read this bit, with, with, with the poles on their shoulders. As Moses has commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so this time, no Moses. The Levites, they were appointed. God said, only the Levites. And then they carry the ark with poles, they put it on their shoulders with their dressed, they dressed nicely, and they were going. And God said, That is it. I like it. God said, that This one, I, li I like this service. Verse 16 David told the leaders of the Levites, Appoint their fellow Levites as musicians to make a joyful sound with musical instruments, lyres, harps, and cymbals. So I said, now you live, you are the one to sing no ordinary people, yeah. People who are anointed, people who have been set apart for the Lord. And so it continues, it continues. Now let's jump all the way to 25. So 25. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of the unit of thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed Edom with, with rejoicing. With rejoicing. They were happy. Because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. Sacrifice. So, so, so they realized that I mean the project was smooth. So straight away they sacrificed unto the Lord. Now David was clothed in a robe of fine linen and, and as well all the Levites who were carrying the ark and as well the musicians at the Canaanite who was in charge of the singing of the choirs. David also wore a linen ephod. So all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of rams, horns and trumpets. And of cymbals and the playing of the lyres and harps. And so, I mean, the second time they did it well. But our point is that when we don't do things out of love for God, out of you know, you know, that kind of intimate love for God, He will not take it. He will say, "This one, I don't like it." 
Amen. Is it not like? And again, you, you, I think, I think, I think most of you are married. I mean, just imagine for a moment how your house would be like if there's no intimacy. Chaos. If there's no intimacy. In fact, you cannot agree on anything. And even if you have to communicate, it, it will be about, okay, have you finished? Can I also say my mind? That's communication in some homes. There's nothing like, yeah, so communicate. Okay, you talk. When you finish, I will talk. <coughs> it means there's no intimacy. So all, all that the man or woman is waiting for is, is for the a spouse to learn. Then he or she will say, have you finished? Then he also say yes. Then he or she will start. And the moment she or she start, the other person will not listen. He just close the ear. Talk, talk, talk. Have you finished? Then she wants to say yes. Then the man will take over. So for three hours, nothing will be resolved because there is no intimacy. But where there is intimacy, if, if the husband speaks or the wife, one will listen and say, oh, can you explain this? Really? Oh, how can we do this? You know, Jesus will say, whoever has ear, let him or she hear. Right. So that's what happened. See, that's intimacy. But that intimacy, you just talk, talk. So most of the time, people come to me. What's the problem? Communication. I say, interesting. So the case, because, and once they say there is a lack of communication straight away, there is no intimacy. Yeah. And so those of you who are married, if there is no intimacy, you can knock all right, but there is no intimacy. You know that? You know the difference? Uh, yeah, yeah, laugh. You, you can still knock. You don't knock it. You don't knock it. No. You don't knock it. People are behaving like they're angels. So there can be knocking, but no intimacy. People are laughing. Yeah. And so men who don't want commitment, that's why they go to the prostitute, right? So the point he's he's going there, he said, I'm going to have fun, but I don't want intimacy. I don't want commitment. So I'm going to pay money. So he goes there, say, how much five hundred pounds? That's fine. I'm giving him that money. And I'm, I'm going to have fun with you, but no intimacy. That no commitment. Okay, so 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 when there is no intimacy, we, we have all kinds of you know things, things, things going on. And now our focus is to build an intimate relationship with God, which I think the church where we are going, we truly need this. Hallelujah. Amen. That intimacy is simple. Take your time and do things and relate to God proper. That's intimacy. You take your time. And then you do think it should it should be from your heart. I mean, I mean, I hardly cook. Anytime I'm cooking, there's one thing in my mind in that I want to cook so that whoever would taste it will like it. <laughs> yeah, whoever would taste it will like it. So I'll take my time and I'll add this and I'll taste it and I'll add this and I'll taste it. Before I come up and said, yeah, come and check, I'll make sure it's okay. If it's not okay, I will just spice, do whatever to make sure it's okay. And the moment she comes, I'll tell her, this one, you will like it. <laughs> and then I'll leave the kitchen. I say, you dead. <laughs> I, I, I believe myself. I, I say, this one, you like it. And truly, she'll, she'll say, wow. And then I'll say, you wait for the girls or the boys to come and eat. And then the girls will eat, and then and the mom will ask them, is it nice? They will say, super. <laughs> and, the, and then she will say, oh, that made it. Then they say, oh, that is why. That is why it's <laughs> That's what they say. Oh, that is why it's very nice. <laughs> and then my wife asked me, how did you do it? The trick is simple. I take my time. I just make sure the meat, if you chew the meat, you will like it. If not, I'll take my time to season it a little bit. With the salt or pepper, whatever. Yes. 
are we here? And uh, in fact, I use the same approach anytime I'm writing. So, wow, someone will read. So, is it meaty? Will the person understand? Is it relevant? Will it please God? So, it's, it's called from the soul. We are talking about intimacy. Anything you are doing, just relax. Let it come from you. And once it's from your soul, there will be a touch of it. Because, because, because the human life is in the soul. The, our life is in the soul. So once your soul is involved, that thing has life. And even if I'm helping someone, do the same thing. I'm not just helping, no, no. What can I do that will, 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 will help, will change this person's life? And so I take my time. That, that's intimacy. So it's not difficult. And let's go to Psalm 51. So we are looking at God said, that's what I want. Because I've come to realize that if you are not intimate, you sound a bit fake, is it? Yeah, you sound fake, you are not real, you are not confident, you know. You are, you know, sometimes it don't even make sense. And although you may try to convince that person, but you yourself you know you are not making sense. And somehow then you begin to question your, your, your self-esteem. And, and you think that you know, there's something wrong with it. But when you are authentic, it's coming from your heart. Uh, Psalm 51, verse 5, 6. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. So that was it. When we let's jump to 17. Or 16. You do not delight in sacrifice. Or I will bring it. Meaning burning of animals and stuff. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. 17. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit. A broken and a contract heart. You, God, will not despise. That's what God. So, uh, so the heart is broken, is open. That you know, there is nothing hidden. And that's a broken and contrite heart. There's nothing hidden. Now, anytime I talk to young people, I one of the things I look out for is that sometimes you can see their heart. It's very nice. That's a broken heart. Yeah, what? Of course, unless they want to play smart game on you, but if, if they are being themselves. So Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, unless you change and become like the little children, you can never enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So it's come from your heart. Now, the reason, between, uh, uh, the reason why David survived and saw the first king of Israel lost everything was this. David committed at least three or four greater sins than Saul. But David survived. Saul's sin was, Saul, go destroy the Amalekite. Don't leave anyone. Saul will go and will leave the king. Saul, wait. Don't do the sacrifices. I'll come and do that from the prophet somewhere. And Saul will do the sacrifice himself on two occasions. He lost the kingship. Because when it happened, he, he never repented. He was like, you know. But when David committed all these three, four great sins, he broke down and said, let your will be done. Whatever you do to me is okay. But all I want is that forgive me. And when people talk about forgiveness, they are talking about relationship. And so, and so God said, to David, David, I'll forgive you, but I'll punish you. And David said, that is okay. That was David. When his son Absalom was chasing him, and then, and then another family were cursing him, cursing him, cursing him, seriously raining insults on him. His, yeah, his commander said, should we go and strike him? He said, no, don't do it. Maybe God has instructed him to insult me. That was David. He said, maybe because of my sins, God has instructed him to come and insult me. So don't touch him, just leave him alone. Maybe it is from God, you let go. That was David. David had been saw, he went and killed them easily. 
So David survived. And so, so, so of course, God will say that I have found David a man after my own heart. He will do what I like. Amen. <laughs> okay, so let's finish it. How can we build such a relationship with God? By your free will, uh, we take our time and build a relationship with God thoughtfully. So you take your time and say that I, I just want a good relationship with God. You take your time. Then you find out what God likes. And you just do it. That's the first thing. And, and Hebrews 5, 7, 10. Christ, he submitted to the Father himself. Now if you read the chapter 10 of John, he said that one, one of the reasons why the Father loves me is because I surrender my life on my own accord and I take it. And that's why God loves me. So let's go to John 10. I'm sure it's up verse 26. Uh, let me see if I can get it. John 27. It says, one of the reasons why my father loves me is because I lay I lay my life down on my own accord. Yeah, that's verse 17. John 10, 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. Amen. Amen. So, so to, to really be into it, you tell yourself that, look, I want to do that. No one should force it. And God will love you. Amen. Amen. Intimate. And what will happen is that now you acquire the skill to be intimate. So, so any person you meet, you are always intimate. And then whatever you say will do will touch the person's heart. Because it's coming from your soul. And trust me, you will have good time in life. Your soul, there will always be joy in your heart. Because you are okay. You, are, you will always be happy in your heart. The peace of God will always be in you because the way God made us is that when the soul is not okay, when the soul is defiled, there are secret sins in the soul, trust me, you will not be okay. You will you, be disturbed. That's how God made us. But when there is no sin in the soul, the soul is contrite and broken and it's genuine. You always have the peace of God. In your life. It's something that we lack today. So, so the man was right. He really loved the hymns and the cathedrals. I bet. He's not in favor of following Jesus. In other words, he's not interested to have a relationship with God. And then the second way to build that is that, that one, God will do it. If you don't do it willingly, he will do it. Such a relationship is built in the wilderness, yes? And then God will take you to the wilderness, the secret place. Seasons of hardship are meant to achieve such a deep relationship with God. Hosea 2. Let's read just 14 to 23. So if you don't want to do that, God will take you through the wilderness. So Hosea 2, 14. And so, that was the picture God gave Hosea for the easy drawer. They were stubborn. There was no good relationship. They were God said, I'll, I'll take them through the wilderness. And I mean, not the first one, not from Egypt to the promised land. But this one, another wilderness. And then, then they will grow to love him. So 14, Hosea 2, 14. Therefore, I am now going to, to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. So you will lure her to the wilderness. So it's like a man telling a woman, if you marry me, I will be going to France <laughs> for two months on holiday. And the woman is happy. Yeah. Then once you marry, he says, okay, wait. And <laughs> okay, that's the way to lure. <laughs> so God said, I will lure her. The reason is right. I'll, then I'll take her to the wilderness where there will be no help. 
and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards, and I'll make the valley of Accord a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. 16. In that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. Okay, so the relationship is being built now. 17. I will remove the names of the bales from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In the wilderness. Hardship. 18. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, the best of the sky, and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and saw and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. So, so betroth means that going to get someone you know, as a wife. Forever. Going to take you. That's how God gets us. Forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. Think about in that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain and the new wine and the olive oil and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I call not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Amen. Amen. So that's how God gets us. He takes us through the wilderness and life will be harsh and tough. That the only voice we want to hear is God. And then he gets us into mercy. So, so he does that. And... And, and, and again, that's another beautiful journey. Hallelujah. Amen. But, but normally I tell people that if life is tough and you're not able to build a relationship with God, you've lost it. Because when life is good, it's difficult. When all is going well and you are not intimate, uh, sorry, when all is not going well and you are not intimate with God, when all goes well, you struggle. The time that we build intimate relationship with God is when we're on the world and that's the most that's the place where people are no more interested in you know, because if they call you have nothing to offer them. Yeah, no one is interested in you. They know where you are, just like Australia. No one goes to holidays in Australia. Who goes there? Who goes there? Australia. <laughs> Everyone knows where Australia is, but who goes there? You need 20, 23 hours flight. I mean two hours then you are in Portugal. So <laughs> Come on, go there. So when you are in the wilderness, people know where you are. They know they have your number, but they will never call you because you have nothing to offer. The only voice that will make sense to you is the voice of God. And that's the time that you develop intimacy. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So, so, so when we look at you know the topic of jealousy, you know, th there will come a time people reject you like Joseph. They'll reject you. They'll reject you. They'll reject you. It means that God is placing you on that path in your heart. That you have God in your heart. You must feel it. That, that your heart, when it comes to God, is not empty. That, that, that you, you know that, that, that there is God in that's, that's what God wants. You just know in your heart that, oh, there is God. You know that God is with you and is happy with you. You know it. That God is with you and is happy with you. You know, David, you said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is it? He makes me lie down in green. David knew that God was always with him. You don't need anyone to tell you, you know that, look, it's because, because you just know it. You just know it. There's that assurance in your heart. And then out of that, our services uh, shall be received by the Lord. Amen. Amen. Especially now that we are doing quite a lot. 
the little we do, oh, God will be so happy with it. And we ourselves, like it happened in the days of uh, Jesus, we shall rejoice. Let us pray.